Good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Chadaway. I'm the Dean of Perth, and it's my great privilege to give you a very warm welcome to St George's Cathedral as we gather to celebrate the consecration of David and Hans as bishops in the Church of God. This is indeed a day of great celebration within the life of our diocese and province, but just a few items of housekeeping. Please check your mobile phone. Is it off or at least on silent? If God wants to send you a message, it won't be through your phone, I can assure you. Please don't take any photographs or video during the service. After the service and after the official photograph, our new bishops will be delighted to pose for any photographs for you, until the early hours of the morning, maybe. There are toilets in the Upper Burt Memorial Hall, which is the hall uh, out here on to your right. Uh, just speak to a steward um, if you need direction, or there are some across in the Como Hotel. We've done our best to call the cathedral, and, um, and I give thanks to Mrs Pigeon, who gave the bequest that allowed the air conditioning to be put in. Uh, but should you need water or you're not feeling well, please see the stewards. The stewards are wearing uh, the red sashes. There will be a collection at the offertory and the uh, money donated will go towards the work of the Anglican Board of Mission Australia. During the administration of communion, uh, please note it, it'll be, uh, you'll receive standing and uh, there'll be three places at the front to receive here as well as a place to receive at the font at the west door. Um, please wait to be invited by the communion, uh, to communion by the stewards. If you require a gluten-free host, please come to the front here and receive either from the Archbishop or the Primate and uh, inform them you require a gluten-free host. If you receive communion in your own church, you're welcome to receive communion here. Otherwise, if you don't wish to receive communion, please keep your head bowed for a blessing and please do not dip the consecrated bread in the wine. Intinction is not permitted. In these and all things, please follow the direction of our stewards in the red sashes who are here to help things run smoothly. And to everyone, please join us in Cathedral Square afterwards on the lawn uh, on your left. Um, there's uh, a reception there. We've just be mindful that there's no daylight saving in Western Australia, so it will be, uh, the sun will have set. Just mind your step as you walk around the various uh, levels in the Cathedral Square. But now I invite you to keep a moment of silence and stillness as we continue to pray for Hans and David. The Lord be with you.
I begin by acknowledging my elders past and present. And today we stand on my ancestral land. This is the land of the Wajuk Noongar people. I represent a civilization with the longest continuous connection to this place for some 65,000 years. I represent elders and leaders that have welcomed visitors here to this land for more than 3,000 generations. A welcome to country is a sign of mutual respect I would like to acknowledge the Anglican Church for including today's welcome as part of our important proceedings. Ngalakeni kula kula ngara noch nijin nonga boja. Nonga mo jerpen nijin nijin akwabrak nonga boja kulaong. From the beginning of time to the end, this is Nunga country. Nunga people have been graceful keepers of our nation for many many years. Ngala jerpen mama boja ngala mala mama kwat kwat jerpen nijin ngala mama nijin nonga boja. We respect the earth, our mother, and understand we belong to her. She does not belong to us. In all of her beauty, we find comfort and well-being. And this is now a place where everyone has become a keeper of Noongar country. We ask that you look, listen, understand, and embrace all the elements of Noongar country. This is forever our home. I play Wern on the didgeridoo, so the sound would reverberate through this land, through this budja, to awaken the spirits, to let them know there are visitors here. And I ask that the good spirits watch over each and every one of us while we're at this place, and to ensure there's safe passage back to your families and to your loved ones. With the responsibility bestowed upon me by Noongar elders and leaders of Noongar country, I welcome everybody here today. And I say to you, Kai Wanju Ngan Kor Jerpen, Nija Nunga Buja Dajali Wangi Nunga Buja, Wanju Wanju. Hello and welcome. My heart is happy as we're gathered here on Nunga Country today. Welcome. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Christ, the Son of God, has been revealed as a light to the nations. Let us bring our darkness to his light, confessing our sins in penitence and faith.
merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord.
us pray. Almighty God, by your Son, Jesus Christ, you gave many excellent gifts to your apostles and commanded them to feed your flock. Bless David and Hans, now called to the order of bishops. So fill them with your truth and clothe them with holiness, that as pastors of your church, they may diligently preach your word and rightly teach your people to the glory of your name and the benefit of your church. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Denne er en læsning taget fra Malakirses bog. Se, jeg sender min engel. Han skal bane vejen for mig. Herren, som I søger, kommer med et til sit tempel. Pax englen, som I længes efter, kommer, siger Herre Skærens herre. Hvem kan udholde den dag, han kommer? Hvem kan bestå, når han viser sig? Han er som ilden i smelteovnen, som den lyd, man bruger til blegning. Han sidder og smelter sølvet og renser det. Han renser levitterne og lutrer dem som guld og sølv, så de på rette vis kan frembære offergaver til Herren. Der skal Judas og Jerusalems offergave være Herren til behag, som i alle gamle dage i fortids år. Dette er Herrens ord.
reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, Jesus' parents brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem 
whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favour of God was upon him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, may we hear your word in our heart. May we have your grace to put it into practice in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. The account of Jesus being presented to God in the temple is a beautiful story of devotion. When I read this story in in preparation for tonight, I was struck by just how moving this account is. There are Mary and Joseph, totally committed to God, fulfilling everything required by the law of the Lord, including presenting Jesus to the Lord. Jesus, as the firstborn male child, was consecrated to God and then redeemed through the offering of a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And then there are the other two beautiful characters, Simeon and Anna. They are wonderful examples of people who are so close to God through constant prayer and worship and study, so devout that they were sensitive to God and recognised in Jesus the promised one. 
In many respects, Simeon and Anna are the key characters in this event. They had remained expectant that God will fulfil his promise and send the Messiah. They had remained attentive, looking for the promise to be fulfilled, watchful for the activity of God, even in an environment of foreign occupation where God's prophets had been silent for many years. Simeon and Anna kept turning up, coming to the temple, spending time in the temple, living righteously, steeping their lives in the worshipping activities of the temple, remaining full of trust and hope and ready to respond to God's action. I'm sure there are a number of reasons for choosing the Feast of the Presentation of Christ in the Temple for tonight's Episcopal ordination. It is, after all, early in the year, but not too early. What you might call a Goldilocks time of the year, really. Early enough to get David and Han set for a full year of Episcopal ministry, good value for money, but not too early to get tangled up with summer holidays. But I also think this feast is a great occasion for the ordination of two new bishops because I think the example of Simeon and Anna can be instructive for the ministry of bishops generally. There's something for the church in this. The context for ministry is always important and we all know that we in the Anglican Church of Australia are in a time of change. Decline in church attendance in Australia, while certainly not universal, is very common and is overall our current reality. It's clear that we are moving from one situation to another. In 1971, 86.2% of Australians said they were Christians. 50 years later, in 2021, 43.9% of Australians said they were Christians. The proportion of the Australian population identifying as Christian has halved in 50 years. The rate of decline has accelerated over the past 20 years, from 61% in 2011 to 44% in 2021. And this decline is especially marked among the young. Part of the increased detachment from Christianity has been a rise in the number of people who say they have no religion now up to 39% of the Australian population. This era has been described as a liminal time, a liminal space where the future for the church in Australia is not clear. And that can be a difficult place to inhabit. In a time of rapid change or decline, one of the things that happens is that leaders are put under pressure to do something to fix it, do something to turn it around. People project their anxiety for the future onto others, either blaming them for the problem or looking to them to fix it. So parish leaders, especially parish clergy, find themselves pressurised by their parishes and even bishops to do something. At a diocesan level, in a situation of decline, bishops and diocesan councils are pressured to do something come up with a plan, a strategy, a narrative to turn things around, to ease the pressure, to make it feel like there's something we can do to control the outcome and improve it, to ease the anxiety, which, as I said, is running high. As I said, I think Simeon and Anna have something to say to us in this situation. First of all, Simeon and Anna were people of faith and trust in God. They actually trusted God. They really trusted that God would fulfill his promises and they held on to that trust even in the face of contrary evidence. After all, Palestine was occupied by troops of the Roman Empire. There'd been no prophet in Israel for many years. God seemed silent. But Simeon and Anna didn't give in. They kept trusting. And they kept praying and they kept looking for what God was doing, looking for, with expectation for God to move. That's why they were ready and able to spot what God was doing in this little newborn baby boy. Rather than giving in to the anxiety of others, or even their own anxiety, leaders in the church, and tonight we're talking about bishops, need to be people who follow Simeon and Anna's example of trust in God. 
We're talking about not just intellectual assent, but real trust that brings peace. There are good reasons for us to trust God with hopefulness. First of all is God's character. God is faithful. We do not know exactly what will happen to the Anglican Church of Australia in the future, but we know that in Jesus, God has inaugurated his reign. We pray for God's kingdom to come, trusting that it will. We trust that when Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it, he meant it and he wasn't crazy. The second reason is what we see. We continue to see the light of God breaking into people's lives. We see people coming to faith. We see people being healed. We see the forces of evil being pushed back. We see the effect of God all over the place. The third reason for trust in God's promises is the experience of history. The church has had significant periods of decline before, many of them. Just two examples. In 1750, there were 16 people at the Easter service at St. Paul's Cathedral, London. The Church of England was moribund. Then along came the Wesleys, and the church was renewed. Who would have guessed? In 1921, one of my predecessors in Adelaide, Bishop Arthur Nutter Thomas, said in his address to the annual synod, bemoaning poor church attendance, religion just isn't fashionable anymore. Then following the suffering of the Great Depression and World War II came a period of great regeneration in the church in the 1950s, leading to the highest percentage of the population regularly attending church in Australia ever. Who'd have guessed? History tells us that while there have been periods of decline and very substantial change, God has continued to be faithful to his mission in the world through the church, through the ups and downs. We don't know what's over the horizon, but God is trustworthy. We can put our trust in God. One of the very, really beautiful things about Simeon and Anna was that as well as trusting God, they were also expectant. They were there watching for God to move, open to, fulfilling, open to God fulfilling his promise. As we think about leadership in the church, trust in God is important, but so is expectancy and watchfulness. Over Christmas, I read a book by UK journalist Justin Briley with a really neat title. This is the title. The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. And the subtitle of the book is Why New Atheism Grew Old and Secular Thinkers Are Considering Christianity Again. Briley has a long-running podcast called Unbelievable, in which he interviews people about their belief, and especially he interviews people who describe themselves as atheists or secularists about why they don't believe in God. In his book, Briley says that he is sensing a change, a shift, with significant numbers of the people he engages with reporting that they are once again, or for the first time, considering Christianity, with some embracing the faith. Briley says there's an increasing recognition of the emptiness of the atheist message. He discerns that the tide away from faith may be beginning to turn. Whether Briley is right or not, it's clear that God continues his mission. The sparks of God's reign continue to shower around the world, bringing wholeness and healing, love and light, freedom and joy, even in the midst of the sadness and the suffering and the destruction and the violence. There's no need for anxiety about the future of the church. There's no doubt that we won't be returning to the 1950s, and many people would say hallelujah to that. We don't know what shape or size the church will be, but we know that God's mission will continue until heaven and earth are joined. Our task is to look for what God is doing and join in, to cooperate with God in the making of disciples of Jesus, making the reign of God real in the present as we live our lives, 
always seeking and being led by the Holy Spirit. Many people have a vision for filling the pews with people. Another vision is to fill people with God. To help people see the vision for the world that is the reign of God and to know that they can be a part of fulfilling that the fulfilling of that vision. So David and Hans, I want to encourage you not to be sucked into the temptation of being silver bullet bishops. We don't need bishops who seek to ease the anxiety of others or themselves by doing something to fix it. Simon and Anna were not focused on fixing the problem of Palestine in the first century. They were focused on God. Neither were they doing nothing, drinking cocktails and lying around the pool. Simeon and Anna were doing what was most important. They were looking for God to act, staying tuned into God so that they were ready to do their part and recognise God acting and tell other people about it. We need hope-filled, trusting in God, watchful bishops, watching bishops, who can help the church see God moving and join in with God in God's activity. We need bishops like Simeon and Anna, soaked in prayer and scripture, attentive to and watchful for God, ready to join in and help the church to do the same. In the current era, that's not easy. In many ways, we continue to be captured by modernism. The notion that if we just find the right lever to pull, all will be fixed. There is a tension for us in following Simeon and Anna's example. But I am convinced that it's a tension worth living. So David and Hans, as you begin this new phase of your ministry, be assured of our prayers. And we invite you to be reminders to us of those saints, Simeon and Anna. As they trusted, actually trusted in the faithfulness of God, so might we. As they looked for God to fulfil his promises, so might we. As they were full of the Holy Spirit, so might we be. Amen. Let us together affirm the faith of the Church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and of our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. in the Church of God, we present to you hands to be consecrated to The first authority for consecration. On 10 August 2023, the Most Reverend Mother and God, K. Marie Goldsworthy AO, Archbishop of Perth and Metropolitan of Western Australia, formally sought the concurrence of the Council of the Diocese of Perth to the appointment of the Reverend David Andrew Bassett, priest, as an assistant bishop in the Diocese of Perth under section 13.2, part 5 of the Archbishop's Statute 2016. The Council of the Diocese of Perth unanimously concurred with this appointment. I, Eric Maitland Rossaggi, Chancellor of the Diocese of Perth, by virtue of part 5 of the Archbishop's Statute 2016, duly passed by the Synod of the Diocese of Perth, do hereby certify that the Reverend David Andrew Bassett, priest, has been duly appointed to this office within the provisions of the Constitution of the Anglican Church of Australia, the Constitution of the Province of Western Australia 1914, the Constitution Act of the Diocese of Perth 1871, and Part 5 of the Archbishop Statute 2016. And I, as Chancellor of the Diocese of Perth, do hereby further certify, in accordance with section 13.4, part five of the Archbishop's Statute 2016, and the Constitution of the Anglican Church of Australia, that the Reverend David Andrew Bassett, priest, has been confirmed by me as Chancellor as being canonically fit for this office, and that accordingly the consecration may lawfully proceed. Second authority for consecration. On 10 August 2023, the Most Reverend Mother and God, K. Marie Goldsworthy AO, Archbishop of Perth and Metropolitan of Western Australia, formally sought the concurrence of the Council of the Diocese of Perth to the appointment of the Reverend Hans Henrik Christensen, priest, as an assistant bishop in the Diocese of Perth under section 13.2, part five of the Archbishop's Statute 2016. The Council of the Diocese of Perth unanimously concurred with this appointment. I, Eric Maitland Rossaggi, Chancellor of the Diocese of Perth, by virtue of part five of the Archbishop's Statute 2016, duly passed by the Synod of the Diocese of Perth, do hereby certify that the Reverend Hans Henrik Christensen, priest, has been duly appointed to this office within the provisions of the Constitution of the Anglican Church of Australia, the Constitution of the Province of Western Australia 1914, the Constitution Act 
of the Diocese of Perth, 1871, and Part 5 of the Archbishop Statute, 2016. And I, as Chancellor of the Diocese of Perth, do hereby further certify, in accordance with Section 13.4, Part 5 of the Archbishop Statute 2016 and the Constitution of the Anglican Church of Australia, that the Reverend Hans Henrik Christensen, priest, has been confirmed by me as Chancellor as being canonically fit for this office and that accordingly the consecration may lawfully proceed. The Anglican Church of Australia, being an apostolic church, receives and retains the Catholic faith, which is grounded in Holy Scripture and expressed in the creeds and within its own history, in the 39 articles, the Book of Common Prayer, and in the ordering of bishops, priests, and deacons. In accordance with the canons of this church, I now require you to make your declaration and assent to this faith. David. I, David Andrew Bassett, firmly and sincerely believe the Catholic faith, and I give my assent to the doctrine of the Anglican Church of Australia, as expressed in the 39 Articles of Religion, the Book of Common Prayer, and the ordering of bishops, priests, and deacons. I believe that doctrine to be agreeable to the Word of God, and in public prayer and administration of the sacraments, I will use the form in the said book prescribed and none other, except as far as shall be ordered by lawful authority. I, Hans Henno Christiansen, firmly and sincerely believe the Catholic faith, and I give my assent to the doctrine of the Anglican Church of Australia, as expressed in the 39 Articles of Religion, the Book of Common Prayer, and the ordering of bishops, priests, and deacons. I believe that doctrine to be agreeable to the Word of God, and in public prayer and administration of the sacraments, I will use the form in the set book prescribed, and none other, except as far as shall be ordered by lawful authority. David and Hans are going to hold those books again in a moment. David and Hans, you have been chosen to serve as a bishop in the Church of God and serve as assistant bishops of the Diocese of Perth in the Anglican Church of Australia. And in accordance with the law of our church, I now require you to declare your assent to the constitution and canons of this church 
and to take the oath of canonical obedience. And David's going to hold that gospel book again as he does it. I, David Andrew Bassett, do solemnly and sincerely declare my assent to be bound by the Constitution of the Anglican Church of Australia and the Constitution of this Diocese and by the canons, statutes, ordinances and rules, however described, from time to time of the Synod of this Diocese and of the General Synod, which have force in this Diocese. And I do swear that I will pay true and canonical obedience to the Archbishop of Perth and all the successors of that bishop in all things lawful and honest. So help me God. I, Hans Henrik Christiansen, do solemnly and sincerely declare my assent to be bound by the constitution of the Anglican Church of Australia and the constitution of this diocese and by the canons, statutes, ordinances, and rules, however described, from time to time of the synod of this diocese, and of the general synod which have force in this diocese. And I do swear that I will pay true and canonical obedience to the Archbishop of Perth and all the successors of that bishop in all things lawful and honest. So help me God. Dear friends in Christ, you have heard testimony given that David and Hans have been duly and lawfully appointed to be bishops in the Church of God and have made the ascents and taken the oaths required by the canons of this Anglican Church of Australia. We now ask you to declare, do you accept David to minister as bishop? By the grace of God, we do. Do you accept Hans? to minister as bishop. By the grace of God, we do. Will you then uphold and support David and Hans as bishops? By the grace of God, we do. David, do you trust that you are called by God to the office and work of a bishop in the Church of God? I believe I am called to this ministry. Hans, do you trust that you are called by God to the office and work of a bishop in the Church of God. I believe I am called to this ministry. The people have affirmed their faith at their trust in you. Will you endeavour to fulfil this trust in obedience to Christ? I, I will, will, by the, by the grace, grace of, of God. God. The scriptures tell us that Jesus spent the whole night in prayer before he chose and sent out the twelve apostles. Likewise, the apostles prayed before they appointed Matthias to be one of their number, as did the church at Antioch before commissioning Paul and Barnabas for their mission. Let us therefore follow their examples and offer our prayers to God as we prepare to consecrate David and Hans to be bishops in the church of God. God the Father, have mercy on us. God the Son, have mercy on us. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Grant to your people the forgiveness of sins, growth in grace and the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. Send your peace to the world which you have reconciled to yourself by the ministry of your Son, Jesus. Lord, hear our prayer. Heal the divisions of your church, that all may be one, so that the world may believe. Lord, hear our prayer. 
Lead the members of your church in their vocation and ministry, that they may serve you in true and godly living. Lord, hear our prayer. Raise up faithful and able ministers for your church, that the gospel may be known to all people. Lord, hear our prayer. Fill them with compassion, clothe them with humility, and move them to care for all your people. Lord, hear our prayer. Inspire all bishops, priests, and deacons with your love, that with all your people they may hunger for truth. Lord, hear our prayer. Bless your servants, David and Hans, who are to be admitted to the order of bishops. Pour your grace upon them, that they may faithfully fulfill the duties of this ministry, build up your church, and glorify your name. Lord, hear our prayer. Sustained by the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, all who are called to the ordained ministries of your church, and encourage them to persevere to the end. Lord, hear our prayer. Gather us with Mary, the mother of our Lord, with the righteous Simeon and Anna, and all your saints, into your eternal kingdom. Lord, hear our prayer. Eternal God and Father, you have promised to hear those who pray in the name of your Son. Grant that what we have asked in faith we may obtain according to your will, through Jesus Christ our Lord. A bishop is called to maintain the church's witness to the resurrection of Christ from the dead, to protect the purity of the gospel, and to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. As a chief minister and pastor in Christ's church, you are to guard its faith, unity and discipline, and promote its mission in the world. You are to ensure that God's word is faithfully proclaimed, Christ's sacraments duly administered, and Christ's discipline applied justly with mercy. You are to lead and guide the priests and deacons under your care, and be faithful in the choosing and ordaining of ministers. You are to watch over, protect, and serve the people of God, to teach and govern them, and to be hospitable. You must therefore know and be known by them, and be a good example to all. These are the duties of a bishop, and they are weighty. Are you willing to perform them? I, I am willing. May, May God guide and help me. The scriptures and ancient canons of the church require that we should not be hasty in the laying on of hands to admit anyone to an office of government in the church. Therefore, I ask you these questions so that all present may hear how you are determined to act in the church of God. Are you convinced that the holy scriptures contain all doctrine necessary for eternal salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Will you instruct from them the people committed to your care, teaching nothing as essential to salvation, which cannot be demonstrated from the scriptures? I, I am, am convinced, convinced and will, will do so with, with God's God. help. Will you then be faithful in prayer and diligent in the study of the Holy Scriptures? so that you may be equipped to teach and encourage with sound doctrine. I will 
seeking to discern the mind of Christ by the Spirit of God. Will you proclaim the gospel to all, especially those among whom you live? Will you lead those in your care to obey our Saviour's command to make disciples of all nations? I will, gladly bearing witness to Christ in the power of God. Will you administer with mercy the discipline of this church? Will you correct and set aside teaching that is contrary to the mind of Christ, both privately and publicly urging all to live in according to God's word? I will, endeavouring to apply the law of Christ with the grace of God. Will you put aside all ungodly and worldly behaviour and live modestly, in justice and godliness, so that by your life and example you may commend Christ's truth. I will, seeking in all I do to demonstrate the love of God. Will you maintain and promote quietness, peace and love among all people? Will you correct and discipline according to the authority you have by God's word? Will you strive to build up the body of Christ in unity, truth and love? I will, commending to all the peace of God. Will you be faithful in ordaining and commissioning others for ministry? Will you encourage those committed to your care to fulfil their ministry? I will, in all things striving to set forward the kingdom of Christ. Will you show compassion to the poor and the stranger? Be gentle with the abused and needy, and defend those who have no helper. I will, striving to be merciful in the name of Christ. May God, who has given you the will to do these things, give you the grace and power to perform them. Amen. Amen. Holy Ghost, our souls inspire, and lighten with celestial fire, that the anointing spirit would us thy sinful years
Blessed are you, Lord our God, you have given us your only Son to be the Apostle and High Priest of our faith and the Shepherd of our souls. Exalted as Lord of all, he poured out the Spirit and gave gifts to your people, making some to be Apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry and to build up the body of Christ. And now we give you thanks that you have called these your servants, whom we consecrate in your name to the ministry of bishops in your church. Send down the Holy Spirit upon your servant David, whom we set apart by the laying on of our hands for the office and work of a bishop in your church. Send down the Holy Spirit upon your servant hands, whom we set apart by the laying on of our hands for the office and work of a bishop in your church. Fill these your servants, merciful God, with grace and power, that they may always be ready to proclaim the good news of salvation. Fill their hearts with love of you and your people, that they may feed and tend the flock of Christ. Give them humility and defend them from all evil, that they may exercise without reproach the office of bishop, using its authority to heal and not to hurt, to build up and not destroy. Accept our prayer through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit belong glory and honour, worship and praise, now and for ever. Amen.
David, as you were baptised into Christ, so you are anointed with his gracious spirit. Clothe yourself with Christ, that you remind us constantly of the baptism we share and our identity. Above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Blessed be God forever. David, receive this Bible, study it well and expound its teaching. In it are contained the words of eternal life. Take them for your rule and declare them to the world. Blessed be God forever. David received this cross and remember that the good shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. Confess Christ crucified, proclaim his resurrection, look for his coming in glory. Blessed be God forever. David, receive this ring, seal of Christ's sovereignty, wear it as a sign of fidelity placed by a waiting father on the finger of his returning child. Blessed be God. David received this mitre, a sign of the Holy Spirit's descent as a cloven tongue of fire upon the apostles and upon you in their succession. Empty yourself of all proud striving, seeking only the mind of Christ, the servant of the servants of God. Blessed be God forever. David, receive this staff as a sign of your pastoral office. Be to the flock of Christ a shepherd and not a wolf. Encourage the faithful, support the weak, heal the sick, bind up the broken, restore the outcast, seek the lost. Blessed be God forever. To Christ and his church, build up the body of Christ so that when the chief shepherd shall appear, you may receive the unfading crown of glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. As you were baptised into Christ, so you are anointed with his gracious spirit. Hands, clothe yourself with Christ that you remind us constantly of the baptism we share and our identity in him. Above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Blessed be God forever. Hands received this Bible, study it well and expound its teaching. In it are contained the words of eternal life. Take them for your rule and declare them to the world. 
Blessed be God forever. Hands receive this cross and remember that the Good Shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. Confess Christ crucified, proclaim his resurrection, look for his coming in glory. Blessed be God forever. Hands receive this ring, seal of Christ's sovereignty, where it is a sign of fidelity placed by a waiting father on the finger of his returning child. Blessed be God. Hands receive this mitre, sign of the Holy Spirit's descent as the cloven tongue of fire upon the apostles and upon you in their succession. Empty yourself of all proud striving, seeking only the mind of Christ, the servant of the servants of God. Hands receive this staff as a sign of your pastoral office. Be to the flock of Christ a shepherd and not a wolf. Encourage the faithful, support the weak, heal the sick, bind up the broken, restore the outcast, seek the lost. Blessed be God forever. Remember your commitment to Christ and his church. Build up the body of Christ so that when the chief shepherd shall appear, you may receive the unfounding, unfading crown of glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Do you all please stand. You all turn around and face everybody. Hands. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I present to you the Right Reverend David Bassett and the Right Reverend Hans Christensen, Bishops in the Church of God. We are the body of Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
will be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth. We give you thanks and praise for your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He taught your word with boldness and offered himself to you in perfect obedience. He cared for all as the good shepherd and laid down his life for his sheep. By his death and rising to new life, he brought new life to your people. In baptism you have united us to him and brought us out of darkness to light. And now we give you thanks that in fulfilment of your promise, you pour out your spirit upon us, filling us with your gifts and leading us into all truth. You give us power to proclaim your gospel to all nations and to serve you as a royal priesthood. You ordain ministers to proclaim your word, to care for your people, and to celebrate the sacraments of the new covenant. Therefore, with them and with all your saints who have served you in every age, we give thanks and lift our voices to proclaim the glory of your name.
Merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Therefore we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, unite us in the body of your Son, and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. So as our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our today our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body. For we all share.
Come, let us take this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. God of the nations, we thank you for nourishing us with this holy sacrament. Guide us by your presence, that we may bring your light to those who dwell in darkness and establish your justice in the earth. Most loving God, you send us into the world you love. Give us grace to go thankfully and with courage in the power of your spirit. It is my privilege to welcome the new bishops, David and Hans, on behalf of the Diocese of Perth. Hans and David, in the course of your Episcopal ministry, you may find that somebody collegially, and with no malice intended, raises the question of whether assistant bishops actually exist. So with every other assistant bishop here gathered, I want to assure you that you do exist. And by God's grace and the action of the Holy Spirit in the laying on of our hands, you have entered the apostolic succession with all the responsibilities and obligations that that entails. In the next weeks or months, you may find yourself explaining why a bishop walks in very last place in the order of procession. Your new ministry will require you at various times 
to be agile, alert, clever, fearless and indefatigable. You will need prick ears and sharp eyes. And you may or may not have thought of these attributes as being characteristic of bishops. Perhaps they're characteristic of shepherds, but they are certainly typical of Kelpies. <laughs> and the bishop at times is a kind of Episcopal Kelpie, travelling with and behind and through and around the Church of God to ensure that no harm comes to that which is Christ's own. This is a sacred and solemn duty, but you have been chosen and called, and now you have received the charism to equip you for this ministry. David and Susan, Hans and Ruth, know that as a diocese we have been keenly awaiting your arrival. And this is not primarily because we are poised to hand a long and list of tasks and onerous duties. There are people in this diocese who have known you for years and are delighted to receive you. There are those who don't know you yet but are impatient to meet you. And those of us who have met you in the last little while and welcome you here for you, who you are yourselves, for all that you are and all that you will be with us. Amen. Elise and Thomas, Enoch and Marcus, we know that you will be occasional visitors and not resident here with us. But with your households and loved ones, we hope that you find the Perth connection that you have just gained a happy and hospitable one. Welcome to our beautiful and diverse diocese, to our gold fields and our wheat belt, our beaches and our hills, our vineyards and our cities. We live and minister here because we love this place for its own sake and we hope that you will come to do this too. Hans and Ruth, David and Susan, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we look forward to you joining our gifts to yours as we work together in the service of the Great Shepherd and as God's faithful people seek to further the purposes and work of God's kingdom. The Lord be with you. And to have received all the gifts. So I wonder if Ruth and Susan would come forward and we will just give them a token. I'm only going first because it's alphabetical. <laughs> and for my family and friends that know me, I've written it down. <laughs> Bishop Kate, thank you for those words of welcome. Now, the whole process of invitation to consider this role and the support and encouragement uh, from you, Archbishop Kay, and so many others has been truly humbling. Thank you, Archbishop Kay, for your confidence in me, and thank you for your hospitality and generosity shown in the process. Uh, to the good folk of Perth, Susan and I are very much looking forward to getting to know you and to serving beside you. I want to thank those who have come uh, tonight to share in this occasion, uh, friends old and new, uh, friends from Adelaide, from Melbourne, from Geraldton, Hobart, New South Wales and many other places across Australia. Uh, Archbishop Jeff, 
primate, no longer my direct boss. I'm off script now, may I say righty who? <laughs> I want to thank you for your encouragement and support of my ministry and my calling. Thank you, along with Bishop Denise, for presenting me tonight. I also want to thank my family, mum and dad, uh, for the faith you imputed and for the love you have always given. Uh, to Thomas and Bridget, Elise and Jono, great kids who share our faith and who have supported us in every step, even though it means being apart. It's great we have new technologies. And to Susan, without whom I would not be the person I am, nor would I be able to do this ministry to which I, which we are called. My love, my all. And I'm thankful to God for all he has done in bringing me life and for the hope of the gospel that he has given and that we are now called to proclaim. Friends, thank you. I've got so much oil in my eyes that uh, I'll try to see this from the anointing. Thank you so much for your kind words of welcome Bishop Kate, it means a lot to me. It's an absolute honor to be consecrated bishop here in this beautiful cathedral with you all. I am deeply humbled and I'm thankful for your support. Thank you especially to Archbishop Kay Goldsworthy for her belief in me and for her support of me. Thank you to Uncle Barry Winmar for welcoming us so powerfully to country. Thank you to my friend, Bishop Philip Huggins, who prepared David and I so powerfully for this evening at our wonderfully blissfully, blissful retreat this week down at Shoalwater. Thank you to Archbishop Philip Freer and to Bishop Philip Huggins for presenting me this evening. And thank you to all of you, to the whole Diocese of Perth, present here this evening and beyond. I hope and pray that through the grace of God, I may be worthy of this calling to be a bishop among you. I will certainly do my very best to fulfill and live all the promises I have made before you all this evening. And I cannot wait to get to know you all. And I'm excited about what is lying ahead for us as together we seek continually to grow in the love of God and spread that love to the people of Perth and beyond. Thank you to my wife, Ruth, who has been my rock and love throughout the last 25 years. Thank you to our dear children, Marcus and Ina, and to my father and his partner, my mother-in-law and my family, who have traveled from Denmark, China and Melbourne to be here supporting me this evening. It means the world to me that you are here. Thank you also to my mother, who couldn't be here, but who is watching the live stream back in Denmark. You are always with me in spirit. Finally, thank you to all my friends, my wider family, spiritual directors and teachers, many of whom are here this evening and many who are watching across the world. In closing, with St. Paul from his letter to the Ephesians, it is my prayer that together as a diocese and as local Christian communities, schools and agencies, that together we may be strengthened in our inner beings with power through Christ's spirit and that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith as we are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that all of us may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that we may all be filled 
for the fullness of God. Amen. Thank you. God, our Father, shepherd and guide of all your people, send your blessing on these, your servants, now made chief pastors in your church. Clothe them with your Holy Spirit, so that in all they do and say, they may be examples of love and purity and lead the people committed to their charge. Following the example of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, May David and Hans be wise and faithful stewards of your mysteries, so that at the last they may stand before you blameless, and finally with all your servants enter into eternal joy. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God for ever and ever. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest to you, that your lives may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.